Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Psychology 241 broadcast. Coming to you here from South Campus uh, at Wake Tech. And I have a special guest today. Look who came in to actually have the live class setting. Everybody, meet Ashley. Well, actually, you know her from webinars, so you've seen her name. Uh, Ashley and I have been hanging out for the past hour, catching up, talking about flying all over the country. What a fun life this one's got. Boy, I'm telling you. Um, Austin is a place you need to be. Um, L.A. is a place you need to be. And definitely Colorado Springs. How about that? We're doing fine, Etta. Good to see you, too. And so she's actually going to be sitting in the background. She may stay the whole class. She may have to leave early. Um, I think she's got an appointment later. So if she does get up and decide to walk out, it won't be because I made her mad. No, it will Or maybe it will. <laughs> Who knows? You never know, right? So uh, so we're going to have a little fun today, and I'm, I can't tell you how excited I am to have somebody in class. You know what? Anybody who wants to come to class uh, on South Campus, Building B, Room 285, you are more than welcome to come down and check out a lecture. Holy cow, this is like... This is the most people I've seen in uh, Wake Tech. Come on in and say hello. Hi. Come on in and say hello. Hi, Folks, how are you doing? This is Trish Foster. Uh, she is uh, one of the faculty members here, too. Three people in this building at one time. This the is parking a, lot's insane. Yeah, the parking lot's insane. Boy, we got a party going on. Hello, I see uh, uh, we've got uh, Crystal Bishop logged in as Ear Candy Chicago. Uh, Stephanie, good to see you. Leanne, you're welcome to come into this class anytime you want. Looks like we've got three people here today. I hope you watched the video I sent around a little bit earlier. Um, I sent the video about the marshmallow test. I think we're going to be talking about that either today or maybe Wednesday. Hmm. Before we get started, I have updated the uh, weekly collaboration folder. This week, we're going to be talking about uh, universal daycare. Uh, I've got an article from the BBC in there uh, that tells you that people from Sweden love to pay their taxes. How about that? People from Sweden just can't get enough of paying taxes. And they do that because the government gets them all kinds of cool things with their tax money. They have an incredible amount of maternity and paternity care that gets paid for, and they also pay next to nothing for their child care. So this week we're going to be talking about that, and I'm going to ask you the question, would you be willing to pay more taxes if you could have awesome free daycare for your children? And to sort of go along with that, I've got uh, three videos from different daycares, four videos from different daycares around the world. One from Sweden, one from Japan, and two from here in America that show you all the different ways that we do um, early childhood daycare. And hopefully uh, you'll take a look at this and you'll say, wow, Chris, raise my taxes and give me the good daycare. Okay. So, uh, yeah, you know what? I'll be the professor today and, uh, and, uh, Ashley will be my assistant professor today. How about that? And Crystal, this is an open invitation. Anybody who wants to come to my class uh, is more than welcome to come to my class. You have to bring your mask in. And when we talk, we'll wear masks. And you probably can't tell. But see, reach out. You can't reach me, can you? See, no. we are more than six <laughs> feet away. So we are teaching in a socially responsible manner here today. Okay, I noticed we have Amal in the class. Good to see you, Amal. Wow, nine people. It's 103. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so today we're talking about Chapter 7, Physical and Cognitive Development in Early Childhood. I love it. If all of y'all crashed the party, you know what? I'd move to my bigger classroom, and I'd teach this uh, sort of as a blended class. I've done a lot of blended classes where I have a classroom full of students and a classroom full of people at home. I can do it that way too. Any way you want to do it, Crystal. Uh, prejudice against people with no kids. Do they have cat? Oh, don't tell my boss, but you can bring your cat, Crystal. Shh. 
You know, I, I won't tell. Yes, what's his name again? Oh, Lord Rexington. Lord Rexington. I forgot that crazy ass name you've got for your cat. But bring Lord Rexington on down, and I'd be more than willing to add him, add her, him, yeah, him to the broadcast. Right? Okay, fantastic. So uh, we're talking about physical and cognitive development. If you remember, in the first few chapters of this book, we split it up. So I did physical development one week, cognitive development the next week. Uh, in early and middle childhood, we're going to smush those two together. So chapter 7 is all about physical and cognitive development in early childhood. Yeah, I don't know if you should bring your dog, Leanne. Not a bad idea, but that dog's liable to bark or piss on my floors, and we can't have that. Right? Okay, so let's see. Here we go. Okay, let's orient ourselves from chapter 1. If you remember, we started out with prenatal period. And then the last three chapters, four, five, and six, we talked about infancy, birth to two, to two years. And we did cognitive, biological, and socio-emotional development. So now we're in early childhood. We've moved up from age three to five. Think of early childhood as that time from when your kid starts walking and talking to when they go to uh, kindergarten. So this is that time we're talking about. Okay, Ashley, we're going from... Uh, walking and talking to when you first start your formal schooling. You guys keep an eye on her. If she starts making faces at me behind my back, you let me know, okay? There'll be no picking on Dr. Roddenberry when he's not looking. Okay, so uh, let's talk about early childhood. You know what? Somebody, somebody, somebody sent me a text. Actually, it was from a student from last semester. I don't know if you know this, but um, uh, life expectancy took a two-year hit this last year. The life expectancy for Americans dropped two years because of the COVID virus. Things like viruses, early childhood, deaths, all of that stuff figures into uh, life expectancy. And life expectancy has dropped two years because of the, uh, the virus. So let's look at life expectancy here in, across the lifespan. One of the things I want you to notice looking at this chart over here is that our men, the blue line, are going to tend to die a little bit earlier than are the females. And notice the red, the females, they're going to live to be the oldest, right? But the most important thing I want you to notice is your chance of dying, your likelihood of dying is the best it is right now. So you'll notice there's a little bump from zero to two, and that represents those congenital disabilities and SIDS and all that stuff that kills kids and shaken baby syndrome that kills kids during their first year. If you make it through the first couple of years of life, from now until your teenage years, it is going to be the safest time of your life. And you know what? The most common death during this, pit, during this age is accidental injuries and that's why they tell you to child proof your cabinet so your kids don't eat the medicine that's why we use the daycare seats and it's such a big deal with the law officers uh, that you have your kids belted up that's why we do all this safety stuff because really the only danger to your kids this age is uh, accidental death and if you look at this picture underneath me you'll see this kid right here getting ready to kill himself pull a TV over on himself and then you'll notice these things called jarts. Back when I was a kid, they had these big metal darts that you would get. And the idea was you would throw these darts and try to hit them in this circle of hoops. And it's kind of like uh, a bingo or a soft toss or something. Okay. But you know what? Yeah, the one thing we wanted to do was to throw these jarts at one another. And lots of people died. And so jarts are now illegal. They have plastic jarts because they'll kill you if you're not careful. Okay, um, this is where your niece is at. Okay, so uh, Leanne has a niece during this age. Okay, so early childhood, two to five years, the time between your, when your kid learns to walk and talk and when they start formal, formal skill, schooling. Now, kids do not grow as fast during this age as they do during early childhood. So your kid's going to freaking double their height um, in the first two years of life. You do not double your height every year. Can you imagine me going from five foot seven? six to uh, 11 foot next year? No, it doesn't happen. Growth starts to slow down, and it starts to slow down during this period. The average growth during this age is two and a half inches and five to, town pen, five to 10 pounds per year, okay? Um, and that's what we're gonna see during early childhood, two and a half inches in height and five to 10 pounds per year during early childhood. 
those patterns do vary individually. During this period, your boys are going to be a little bit bigger than girls. Now, girls go into puberty before boys do, and so you know what? Our girls are going to have this growth spurt, so when we get to middle and late childhood, the girls are actually going to be a little bit bigger. Can I get you to just a little bit? There you go. So I can be in the picture, too. <laughs> okay. So, uh, the two most important contributors to height difference, culture and ethnicity. So, urban, upper middle class, uh, firstborn uh, 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 children are going to be bigger. Um, your minorities are going to grow a little bit bigger. And nutrition, getting all you need to eat is definitely going to predict your growth during this stage. Now, underneath me, I've got growth hormone deficiency. Now, it turns out there are some people who don't grow, and it's not because they don't get enough to eat. It's because they have a hormone deficiency in their body. And this hormone is typically produced by the pituitary gland to stimulate the body to grow. However, some kids who have this growth hormone deficiency, they won't grow taller than five feet. They'll be four foot tall when they grow up. Now, um, this is uh, not a good thing. And you know what? You, you folks know standing out in middle school and junior high school is always a bad thing. And, you know, height is one way you can stand out. BMI is another way you can stand out. Um, and so a lot of people choose to take the hormone therapy in order to try and reverse this problem so they don't stand out so much. Your boys uh, are more likely to take the growth hormone therapy because for us boys, getting big and tall is more important, right? And I'm... Absolutely. And dude, I suffered as the shortest boy in my class. Let me tell you, that sucked. That's why I learned how to fight. Maybe I wasn't as tall as you, but I'd let you taste the fist if you tease me, right? Now, it turns out that these hormones does work. And you know what? It does lead to improvements in self-esteem. So I do want you to know a little bit about physical growth and the dangers during this particular age. Okay? All right, next thing. Remember neurological development. Underneath me, we have a picture of the myelin tissue, which is encasing the axon. That's a cross cut of an axon. The middle part is the axon, and then the brown stuff wrapping around it is the myelination that insulates it and makes it work uh, better. Okay? Um, now, uh, the brain actually reaches. You're born with a big head. Crystal, you were making fun of that on Facebook, talking about the big head at birth. I uh, saw you making fun of that several weeks ago. You know what? Your head starts out bigger, and it's also the part of you that grows the fastest in early childhood. So by the time you're three years of age, your head is three-quarters of its maximum size. And by the time you're a six-year-old kid, your head is pretty much full of grown. And that's why, if you've ever seen little Pop Warner football players, they always look so funny with those big helmets on top of those little bitty legs, right? And it's because their head's fully, fully grown. Now, there's very little growth in the brain after three years. So your brain's not growing any bigger. Instead, what you're getting is it's reorganizing. So first couple of years of life, the brain grows bigger, and then it starts to reorganize the brain connections. Uh, no, you will not have to know the anatomy of a neuron. Just know that myelination is a part of, that's one of the things that makes the brain grow in size during the first uh, couple years of life is because it's not because you're getting new parts of the brain it's because you're getting all this fatty tissue that's growing around your axons and that's why your brain reaches this 75th percentile in adult volume now the most rapid growth in the brain uh, during this period is the frontal lobe babies cry and you can't get them to stop crying they won't sit down they won't shut up you can't talk to them for more than 10 seconds without them losing interest in you. But you know what? As your child begins to myelinate this frontal lobe, they're ready to sit down and shut up and finally go to formal schooling. Some people like to send their kids to kindergarten a little bit early. Make sure your kid is ready for kindergarten. Can they sit down and pay attention? The boys' brains myelinate a little bit slower, and sometimes boys are not ready to go to kindergarten at four and a half years. Maybe your females are, but you set your kid up for failure if you push them into school and they're not emotionally ready for that. So there's, you're not going to ruin your kid's education if they start kindergarten at five and a half instead of four and a half. Really, make sure that your child is ready for school.
In fact, in fact, Miseducation of Kids, one of my favorite books. This guy right here, David Elkin, says that really a lot of times the way we can ruin our kids in early childhood is putting too much academic pressure on them. Really, you want them to learn how to be good, polite citizens. Don't worry about teaching them French or how to write in cursive. All you're going to do is make them anxious. The Miseducation of Children. Great book by David Elkind, if anybody's interested. Um, poverty and parenting skills do impact brain development. Um, remember, that's why we have uh, Head Start, because a lot of times parents in impoverished backgrounds, they don't have the time to give their kids the stimulation that they need. And so you really want to help the neurons knit together. So uh, increased myelination at three is related to improved cognitive uh, skills. There you go. Jay Yoon br brings up a good point. The tiger moms. Yes. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, tiger moms out there. You know what? I uh, went to it. I am not Jewish, but I, uh, I grew up around uh, Jewish people because my mom, uh, my aunt married a, a Jewish fellow. So I went to synagogue all the time. I went to bar mitzvahs. When I went to college, I joined a Jewish fraternity. And it turns out that all of those Jewish people were really driven by their parents as well. So, Jay, it's not only the tiger mom. Um, some of my Jewish friends uh, really grew up in very challenging uh, environments. And they used to laugh at me and say, Roddenberry, you're ruining the house GPA. We all have 4.0s and you're rocking that 2.8. I wasn't a great student back then, right? That's why I was telling you earlier, you can still be a neuroscientist, even if you didn't make great grades. Actually, you do make great grades. She's going to be a neuroscientist, right? Now, most preschool children are more active than they will ever be at any period in their life. We always talk about them having endless energy. And most grandparents will say, boy, I wish I had that kid's energy. Yes, you do. Kids have more energy during this time than at any time in their life. And you know what? They're learning how to jump and run and do all those gross motor abilities. And their fine motor abilities are going to come along a little bit later. If you look at the pictures underneath me, this is a picture of, uh, of a pelican on the left here, the black squiggly lines, written at about the age of three. And then this is a Christmas tree written at the age five. Can you folks see how much better the fine motor control is at five than it was as three? So fine motor skills are going to lag behind uh, uh, at this age than the gross motor skills. Now, pincer skills, uh, this is an important thing that separates us from the monkeys. This is what symbolizes us. We can write pencils. We can do surgery. This is pincer grasp. It's present, but it's not great at three years old. Fine motor coordination gets a little better at four-year-olds, but I used to be a baseball coach for, uh, for uh, 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 oh, goodness me, t-ball, and honestly, t-ball players suck. They're not very good because they can't catch. They don't have that motor coordination. That's going to come a little bit later, uh, but they're going to start getting that motor coordination. Instead, they're going to be uh, engaging in simple movements at age three, by age four, you're going to have a freaking daredevil on your hands. They're going to be climbing those monkey bars, and you're going to be saying, stop. They're going to want to climb on the shelves. You're going to say, stop. And by the time they're five, they're going to do things that are absolutely going to scare you out of your wits as a parent. Remember, number one cause of death is accidents. So stay on those kids. Don't let them get too crazy. But they are going to be pretty adventurous uh, at about the age of five. Now, with regard to perceptual development, some kids are a little farsighted at this age, but that's okay. We're not really doing reading yet, so they're not going to see as well on the close-up stuff. Don't worry, that's going to come a little bit later. Um, but their ability to focus, move eyes, and pay attention to close objects will be available ready by school age. That's another one of those things. You want to make sure your kid's ready before you can get them in kindergarten. Please don't push your kid into kindergarten. They can learn to read at six and still turn out to be a fabulous reader. But if you push them at four when they're not ready to read and turn them off, then they'll never be a good reader because they won't be interested in doing it. Most tiger moms make the mistake of killing their kid's interest. You don't want to kill your kid's interest. You want them to have fun in school. And that occurs when you let them play and do blocks and have the fun stuff. 
Uh, I saw my kids in daycare and crap playing with box and colors and colors and playing with trains. Hell, that looks like a lot of fun to Chris, the 50-year-old. Let your three-year-old do that for a while, right? Okay, sleep. Sleep should, kids probably by now should be sleeping during the night. And usually around three to four, they may be taking one nap during the day, but not two naps at this period. They've usually moved out of the nap period. I'll be quite honest, as a 50-year-old academic, I love an afternoon nap. Uh, so as you get older, like me and 28-year-old Ashley over here, we like some afternoon naps, right? 11 to 13 hours a day is recommended because they're still myelinating and growing those nerve neural connections. And if you really want to get your kid to, uh, to get in, into a really good bedtime rhythm, you need to have a bedtime. Put your kids to bed at a good time. And honestly, for adults, you need the me time. There's nothing wrong with putting your kid to bed at 9 o'clock. A lot of people let their kids own the night because, well, he or Tommy or Sheila doesn't want to go to sleep. Forget that. Put their little butts to sleep and make them go to sleep. They need the sleep. You need the time. You know what? Kids who don't get enough sleep are going to have attention problems that may even last into adolescence. They're going to have worse school readiness because the brain isn't knitted together. Uh, you know what? Because they're going to act out, they're going to have poor peer acceptance and social skills. And you know what? Sleeping is one of those rhythmic things like eating. So you really need to get them into good sleeping and eating habits so they don't go into school overweight either. Now, kids at this age need about 1,300 calories a day. You typical adults need 2,000 calories a day. 1,800 to 2,000 man versus woman. Um, but the little kids don't need quite as much. And you know what? Keep them away from fast foods because one fast food dinner is going to blow all their calories out without giving them any of the nutrients. Did you know 93% of all fast food options contain 430 calories? That's a third of your kids' calories in one fell swoop. You know what? The most commonly consumed vegetable here in America? French fries. French fries. Terrible, terrible, terrible. With the exception of Bojangle French fries, which are so good. <laughs> I would say, keep your kids away from the French fries. Get them into the broccoli, the mashed potatoes, baked potatoes. You can even dab in a little sour cream if you need to. But get your kids into good eating habits young. If they start eating good young, then they'll come back to it. Now, teenagers eat for crap anyhow, but I promise they will come back into those good eating habits. Now, if you want your kids to eat well, you need to eat well. And Crystal, I saw the dinner that Bradley fixed for you on Sunday night. Fabulous. Vegetables, the grilled meat. That was a good dinner. That's the kind of dinner you want to show your kids, Crystal. Don't eat hamburgers and cheeseburgers and then expect them to eat vegetables. you got to model that behavior. All right? Now, kids who are overweight at 5 are four times likely to be overweight at 14. And being overweight can lead to stigma, poor self-esteem, and actually it's not a good health behavior. You put more stress on the heart and the organs. And you know what? Get those kids out and run. I know, Crystal, but you're showing good eating behavior in case you ever do. So be sure to show your friends' kids those eating habits, all right? I just wanted to call you out because I saw that dinner and it looked so healthy. Now, most people put their kids in front of the TV or in front of the iPhone or in front of the video games. No, no, no. Get their little butts outside. You know what? Back in the 70s, mom used to kick me out first thing in the morning and you weren't invited back in the house till lunchtime. Of course, we didn't have video games. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have any of that stuff. But get them out running around because that's going to... That's going to make them sleep better at night. That's going to burn some of those bad calories you're giving them. And that's going to help them control their weight and keep a healthy weight going into the school years. All right. Let's talk a little bit about language development. Oh, I'm telling you, uh, Crystal, that guy you got is such a keeper. He is the man. He is perfect marriage material. Boy, that badly, I can't say enough good things about him. Holy cow, he is the man. Did I blow him up enough? Okay, let's talk a little bit about language. Now, last week when we were talking about cognitive development, or two weeks ago, I suggested to you that kids learn languages 
words really quick. As long as you point at a word or look at a word and say it, your kids will pick up words almost effortlessly. It turns out that they pick up 8 to 12 words a day. We call that amazing language ability, fast mapping. <laughs> now, during the preschool years, your kids are going to become sensitive to the sounds of spoken words. They're going to learn how to produce all the sounds of their uh, language. Maybe some of you are named Sissy or Mimi or Poo Poo or whatever because uh, your little nephew couldn't say your name properly. They're going to figure that out. They're still going to have that silly nickname for you, but they're now going to be able to say those words that they couldn't say as uh, early kids. They're going to start demonstrating the knowledge of morphological rules. Look at this. Uh, Ellen Burko did this cool test. It's on the other side of the screen here. She showed kids. She said, this is a rug. Now there are two of them. There are two. Ashley says rugs. And that's because Ashley knows a morphological rule. If you want to have more than one of, you add an S to it. And she found that children, even without being told, seem to intuit the rules of good grammar. They're going to use plurals, possessive, prepositions, articles. Dude, they're going to start talking. I mean, they're just going to start talking. They're going to learn how, and how to apply and use the rules of syntax, which is good grammar. And they're going to develop pragmatic ability, although this is the one that's going to lag. They're sometimes going to say things that embarrass you. Oh. Mommy, why does that man have a birthmark on his face? And, you know, you're going to be like, you're going to be so embarrassed because sometimes there are things you're not supposed to say. But you know what? Kids starting around three or four are going to be able to understand how to take turns. If you've ever talked with a two-year-old, sometimes they run on without giving you a chance to talk. But at three and four, you know how to share. I don't know if you've ever had a conversation with a person who won't give you a chance to talk. Don't you hate talking with somebody that doesn't, you know, let you butt in, right? They learn how to change their speech style. So a four and five year old knows that you can't talk to a two year old like you can talk to a parent. So they actually learn how to communicate effectively. We call these communication, uh, these effective communication tools, we call it pragmatic language abilities. Now, uh, if you want your kids to learn how to uh, uh, improve your kids' language ability, there are six key principles to kids' vocabulary development. Kids learn the words they hear most often. So if you're always using the F word, guess what your kids are going to learn? I learned that the hard way when my little kid said S-H-I. You know what? I was using that word just a little too much, and old CJ busted it out on me at three years of age. So, and they're also going to learn the language of things and events that interest them. So make sure you're getting them involved in things that are interesting. They're going to be better in interactive contexts, so you're going to conversate with them. Don't lecture at them. Talk with them. They're best in contexts with, context which are meaningful. So don't tell them about cooking. Take them into the kitchen and let them help you cook. Give them some context. And you know what? Don't be, don't be afraid of telling them what words is. This is lotion. This is lotion. We call lotion. Lotion, you put on your face. See, that's what you do with the lotion. Kids don't know every word. Don't be afraid to tell them what words mean. And you know what? Make sure you're trying to use good grammar and vocabulary because that's what your kids are going to use as a model as they learn grammar and uh, vocabulary. Yeah, it is funny when they say that. I mean, I had to laugh because I, I was the only one I could bring uh, when, when my kid burst it out. Oh, you know what? When I was six years old, uh, my mom was taking me and my best friend, this girl named Terry, to the beach for the day. We lived up in New Jersey. And somebody pulled out in front of my dad. And my dad beeped the horn and said, you bastard. And my wife said, Robert, don't say that in front of the children. And Terry said, bastard's not a bad word. My mom calls my dad that all the time. <laughs> I thought that was absolutely hilarious. Right? Now, uh, this week we're going to talk about variations in early childhood uh, education. Now, most of us will have to go back to work, especially here in America. Uh, we don't have as good a child care policies. It's difficult. You don't have this social support. And so we're going to need to put our kids into 
uh, daycare sometimes. Now, a lot of people choose to send them to mom or grandmas or dads and, or uncles, aunts. That's fine, too. But there are different approaches to what we would call formal early childhood education. And that's going to be the focus of our webinar uh, later to, uh, this week. And so uh, your book talks about different kinds of education. So uh, your book talks about child-centered education. Now, in child-centered education, what we're doing is we're not just trying to teach them our blocks and our letters, although that's important, but we're also te teaching them morals, how to share, how to be kind. We're teaching them how to control their emotions, how to be good play partners. So in this education, uh, educational philosophy says, you know what, you're not just teaching them this school stuff. You're trying to give them a well-rounded socio-emotional development so they're good citizens as well as being just good students, right? And we do this through having puppet shows by letting them model these activities. Let them play games where kids have to take turns and share. And so we do that through first-hand experience. And you're going to see in the daycare examples that I show you how they're doing this child-centered approach using first-hand experience. And you know what? In these approaches, they're going to focus more on play than school. More on play than school. You may not believe it, but playing is how you learn. In fact, one of the reasons that I like to make my classes a lot of fun is because I believe when we're having fun, we're learning. If you've ever been into that history class that you freaking hate because it's so damn boring, uh, you're not learning anything. I believe that you have fun when you learn, and that's especially important when you have to really focus to keep kids in, engaged. And you're going to want them to experiment, explore. You're going to restructure things and try things out. You're going to give them a chance to speak as well as to listen. So the teacher may read the story and point the pictures. What is this? And you'll say, oh, it's the lion. Is the lion scary or not scary? And you'll say scary or something like that. So I'm going to let Ashley engage with me and we're going to have fun, right? Now, I don't know if any of you ever went to Montessori. Montessori, did you? I, I didn't go, but my, my friend's uh, mom worked there. Ah, very her, expensive. Very, 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 very yeah. expensive. Because it's got a low teacher to student ratio and they've got all these tools. The idea in the Montessori education is that the kid will choose their own level of interaction based on their abilities, and your job as a teacher is just to scaffold them in whatever they choose to play. So you don't have to do the letters and words if you don't want to. You can play with the blocks and work on shapes. You decide what you want to interact with. If it's learning length, you learn length. If it's learning number, you learn number. If it's learning language, you learn language. You decide what you want to pick. And in the Montessori classroom, they've got all these really cool-looking hip toys. And the kid pulls them out. The teacher shows them how you're supposed to play with the toy. And then the kid can do anything with the toy. And if the kid requires help, the teacher then jumps in and scaffolds the behavior. When the kid's done with the toy, the kid plays with it as long as they want. And when they're done, they put the toy back up and then move to a different toy. Mm -hmm. So whereas in the child-centered king kindergarten, we're all doing it as a group and we're doing different activities together, your kids in the Montessori are working individually at whatever intellectually stimulates them. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with the Montessori approach, some people say, aside from being super-duper expensive, it de-emphasizes verbal interaction. And social interaction is a really important part of life. It restricts imaginative play because I give you these blocks and you're supposed to play with them in a certain way. And it may not allow for creativity in a variety of learning styles because I give you blocks and sort of more educational styles tools. Not as much in uh, not as much pretend play as it is learning uh, uh, the properties of the world. Physics, size, shapes, things like that. Now, um, and then some people talk about developmentally appropriate practice. You might say in the children's child-centered kingdom, maybe Billy isn't ready for a story. 
maybe Billy isn't ready for math. So why is Billy doing that, right? Mm -hmm. So some, uh, some people suggest taking what we call a developmentally appropriate practice. What they suggest is you really need to pay attention to what that kid can do. And maybe we'll split the class up. I don't know if any of you remember having different reading groups in school or different math groups. Mm -hmm. That's sort of developmentally appropriate practice. You guys are going to work on minuses because you've figured out pluses. Billy hasn't figured out pluses yet, so we're going to do pluses for his group, right? And so this focuses on social and cognitive development, taking into account age and uniqueness. A lot of times when you get to school and you've got 35 kids and a teacher, a teacher's handicapped. They can't do developmentally appropriate practice for everybody, and it's sort of the one-size-fits-all. But in daycare, usually the uh, educator to, to student ratio, if it's a developmentally, if it's a good daycare, you'll have small enough classrooms where teachers can break up into small groups and engage in these developmentally appropriate practices. Uh, usually these events are active learning, they use more cooperative and problem solving, and they usually allow the kids to regulate their own behavior. Now the neat thing I like about these is kids aren't stressed because they aren't put in overwhelming situations. It's more socially skilled because they're in small groups, and since kids are talking, it's going to help them develop their language abilities. But you know what? Research doesn't necessarily say that this is better than any other. So I can't tell you that sending the kid down to Nanas is a bad way to do it. I can't say that sending your kid down to the child-centered kindergarten, I don't know if any of you are from Willow Springs, I sent my kids down to Little Stepping Stone. There was nothing special about it. It was just fairly inexpensive and fairly convenient to me. And both of my kids are fairly clever. I wouldn't call any of them genius level, but they still do. Okay. Exactly. Uh, Davina, yes, human beings, actually all animals hate to get frustrated. All human beings, all animals receive a little rush of dopamine when they do something successfully. As long as they're challenged enough. If it's too easy, they get bored and lose interest. But if it's challenging enough and they succeed, like if you've ever done a puzzle, I like Sudoku, when I finish that Sudoku, I always get up and cheer. Uh, yes, it definitely sort of fires up their, uh, their, uh, uh, their uh, emotions and makes them feel good. Um, I went to McGee's Crossroads for kindergarten. I'm sorry it was awful. They needed to use popsicle sticks for behavior. Did they spank you with popsicle sticks? Or did you have like one popsicle stick if you got a bad note and a good note? That's kind of punitive for a daycare. But you know, those McGee's Crossroads people are kind of crazy, man. Okay. Head start. I've got several videos in the course resources folder. Eddie, you said you love the course resources folder. I've got some Head Start, head start uh, folders. Uh, we talked about Head Start a couple weeks ago. We'll talk about them again. Uh, head Start was a program developed in 1965. It's a preschool educational program for young kids that have come from disadvantaged backgrounds where maybe mom and dad have money problems, alcohol problems, or relationship problems that keep them from being that good stimulating parent. Um, it's a compensatory program. That is, it's supposed to help children age three to four uh, get these things. Now, the weird thing with educational daycare, I say it's compensatory, which means if you get enough, you're not necessarily in need of more. So if you get 2,000 calories a day, do, you, do I need to feed you an extra 1,000 calories? No, you've got what you want. So if you get plenty of stimulation, uh, then that's good enough. But what happens is a lot of the, the rich parents saw how much it was helping the daycare parents. They then said, well, if education helps those poor kids, then I'm going to double down on the education for my kids who were already getting enough. This is a compensatory program. If you overstimulate your class, if you push the kids because you think your normal kids are going to do as well with the extra educational resources, you wind up becoming a tiger mom that causes extra pressure. Do you see what I'm saying? It's compensatory. Now, it's the largest federally funded program for children in the U.S. Um, and it provides 
uh, the ability to gain skills and requirements for success uh, in uh, for success in school. Now, the research unfortunately suggests it helps these kids in three and four years of age, but the uh, when you take the kids out of Head Start, unfortunately the effects go away. It doesn't last. The effects don't last as long as you would like it to. Now, um, here's the deal. Uh, he, um, if your mother participates in the program as well and buys into the program, then these gains last a little bit longer. And you know what? These once if the mom or primary caregivers gets in the program, then these changes will last. And research has suggested that they even show effects even into the third grade as long as the parent buys into the process. Now, in 1995, they liked it so much for three to four year olds that they started early Head Start, which now looks at kids from birth to three years. If it helps at three years, why not start it even earlier? An early Head Start uh, is from birth to three years. Now, um, now, uh, so uh, there's the Perry, one example your book talks about that I just want to put out there is the Perry Preschool Program, which was started in Ypsilanti, Michigan. And it was a two-year preschool program that included weekly home visits from the school personnel. Presumably, the school personnel would go there to talk about why they were doing what they were doing and to help the parent learn how to do their own behaviors to scaffold the parent at home. And what they found is that in doing that, um, they actually had even bigger effects on these children because as these children grew up, they were less likely to be engaged in pre teen pregnancies and their graduation rates from high school was approved. And so it's very, very important that you get the parents. Now, they do have some Head Start parent programs, parents where the uh, Head Start um, moms and dads actually come in and receive training too. And what they find is that when you get the parents involved into it, these Head Start program effects last much, much longer. Now, um, and you know what? These kids in the Perry program, they followed it for long term in a longitudinal study and found that age 40, these kids in the Perry preschool program were less like were more likely to be employed, were more likely to own a home, have a little bit of savings, and they were less likely to have been arrested. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how important it is to have the stimulation and the full 360 development on your moral skills, your getting along skills. Um, you know what? If infancy is about making your child uh, 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 comfortable, your three to five years is about modeling and helping them shape and coach the appropriate behaviors. Okay? Now, once they go to school at five or six, then the rest of the world starts taking over and influencing them. But from three to five, you can really, really coach your children. Okay. Uh, you know what? That's about all I had to say for today. Um, does anybody have any questions? It is definitely not good to schedule every second of your child's life. Kids learn creativity through free play. If you tell them what to do, how are they going to learn how to figure out what they want to do? And you know what? A lot of parents are afraid, even though crime is down at its lowest level since the 60s, mm -hmm. people are afraid that their kids are going to get kidnapped, killed, etc., etc. I'm not discounting that fear. It does happen. But you know what? Now, nobody wants to let their kid run outside and engage in free play like we used to do at kids, where we'd run around and play with the gang in the neighborhood. And kids instead want to send their kid to baseball camp, football camp, basketball practice, ballet practice, dancing practice, uh, language practice. And after a while, your kid's doing nothing but organized stuff. Your kid needs to learn how to make their own friends, how to manage your own friends, and how to manage their own life. So I would agree with you, Etta. That's a great point. Um, a great point. What, my tiny war? Are you talking about that? <laughs> It's the only cup I can find. It's the one by the water fountain, my tiny cup of water. <sighs> okay, well, that's all I have to say. Um, we got to go because um, Ashley's got to get to her next appointment, and I've got to uh, get home and start cooking dinner. Uh, it was a great time. I enjoyed having you. 
If anybody has any questions, don't hesitate to send me a text or an email. And don't forget to watch the videos for Wednesday night's uh, webinar. Uh, until then, uh, take care, and I look forward to seeing you later. Bye. Okay. Yeah, my phone is a broadcast. So is that like...